So I think the workers' rights angle to the future of work, to technology, how it's running away from us with no protections or guardrails is the issue of our time. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. This has been the summer of strikes. American workers from coast to coast have clearly had enough and have been standing in solidarity for better wages, better working conditions, and increased benefits. The majority of us know we can no longer carry on like this. The wealth inequality in this country and the chasm between the workers and the owners is leading us down a dark path. Back in the day when unions were at their peak, 40% of American workers were part of a union. Now that number is under 7%. And look what happened in the meantime. The middle class has all but disappeared. The rich got richer while the poor are poorer. And people can't afford homes, food, health care. The majority of people have a side hustle or take gig work on top of their regular job just to make ends meet. And statistics tell us that 40% of Americans are one missed paycheck away from poverty. So in honor of Labor Day, we're going to talk about the workers of America, but more specifically, we're going to talk about the importance of unions, where teams of people come together to speak up for the workers of America. And to help us do that, we're going to be joined by Elizabeth Schuler, the president of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO is a federation of 60 unions that includes 12.5 million working people across all sectors of the U.S. economy. Ms. Schuler is the first woman to hold the office of president in the history of the Labor Federation. A visionary leader and longtime trade unionist, Liz sees the labor movement as a powerful vehicle for progress and unions as the leading force in societal transformation. Her leadership has focused on the future of work, the clean energy economy, workforce development, and the empowerment of women and young workers. President Schuler is committed to using the power and diversity of the labor movement to advance social and economic justice, and is committed to making the benefits of unions available to working people everywhere. Because I'm sure we can all see by now that what we've been doing hasn't been working. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, president of the AFL-CIO and passionate advocate for workers' rights in America, Liz Schuller. Welcome, Liz. Hi, Lee. Thank you. And happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day to you. Thank you so much for joining me. Last Labor Day, we had Mike Monroe, the chief of staff to North America's Building Trades on the show, reminding people that there's this path forward for workers in America and that the people aren't alone, right? We want to remind people that unions all over the country are out here fighting for workers' rights. And as we look around the country this summer, we've seen so many strikes, right? Workers are clearly standing up and finding their collective power. Do you feel that shift going on right now? Because it really feels like the labor movement is out in force. I absolutely do. It is such an exciting moment. We have, I think, over 200 strikes happening right now. Um, it involves, you know, over 300,000 workers. And that's just this year alone. It's 10 times the amount of just two years ago. There's something happening out there. And I think it's workers feeling fed up and fired up because they've seen the sacrifices, you know, through the pandemic, they did their part, and then they see the companies raking in billions and billions of dollars, but yet not finding enough to give them a raise, to give them the security they need. And so they're finding their voice and their power by rising up and actually forming unions. They're connecting the dots that the labor movement is the place to be to make the change they want to see. And I think people should understand that polling data shows there is an unprecedented support for unions and striking workers across the country. People understand that something needs to give. I mean, we hear all the time that no one wants to work anymore, right? But the complete sentence really should be, no one wants to work anymore for these wages or these low benefits, right? People are really tired of being taken advantage of, whether that's six days straight of 12-hour work or unreliable schedules or forced overtime or, in the actor's case, single-digit paychecks, right? Workers in so many industries are upset, and how they're being treated. And I feel like the working people of America are drowning at a time where, as you mentioned, corporate profits have never been higher. And we can see that that's unsustainable. Absolutely. And what I'm most excited by is the public supports unions now at 71%. And then we just released our Labor Day poll that shows young people under the age of 30 support unions at 88%. And 
it's staggering. You know, that means nine out of 10 people under the age of 30 are pro-union. And so now our challenge is in the labor movement to channel that enthusiasm, that activism into connecting the dots and finding a union home. Um, And we're seeing it in so many industries, industries we never thought would organize unions are forming unions. I just, you know, spent time with young people in Louisville, Kentucky, who just organized, I think it was a series of 18 different coffee, local coffee shops in Louisville, who said, you know what, we're tired of working for terrible wages. We don't have predictable schedules. Um, We need a sense of community and strength together. And so they formed a union. And we're seeing that in industries like the tech industry. We're seeing video game developers. Who would have thought they would be forming unions, right? The cannabis industry where young people are gaining their skills. And and unfortunately, in the industry, they're making them sign NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, which limit them from taking the skills that they build up and the expertise Um, They can't take that to another job. And that's just not fair, right? So those are just a couple of examples of the innovations we're seeing around organizing and people finding their way into this labor movement. Right. And I think it comes down to what you're saying about it being not fair, right? I think the majority of people who are on strike right now, who are unionizing or whatever, they're asking for a living wage, but they're also asking for like a real life, this acknowledgement that their work is an essential part of the success of these companies and these organizations who are making great profits or doing very well and that the workers themselves deserve to be respected and compensated for their time and efforts. I mean, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to say that people shouldn't be dependent on a third or fourth job if they're already working full time because the money is clearly out there. It's just not being allocated, as you said, fairly, right? The workers of America are kind of finally standing up and saying, you know what? It's time that we did allocate this fairly. And this idea to me that there's this resurgence of interest in unions right now, it just feels so exactly right on. As I was saying in the introduction of this piece, Back in the day, 40% of the workers in this country were unionized, and now it's like under 7%. And the power of the worker dwindled so much over the past 50 years. You know, we know that trickle-down economics was an absolute failure, and we can see now from things like the UPS union negotiations this summer or the recent Massachusetts public transportation union negotiations to the ongoing Hollywood strike that this kind of collective bargaining is really where it's at, that the worker is really asking for their voice again and they need that voice so they can ask for more power and demand more respect and get the the conditions that they need. It seems like your federation is putting a major emphasis on expanding and organizing right now. Do you want to talk me through that, what you guys are doing? Sure, absolutely. And I should remind folks that the AFL-CIO is, yes, a federation of unions. So we have 60 different unions in our umbrella, and we represent 12 and a half million working people, um, you know, in every industry you can imagine, in every part of the country, um, from folks in the construction industry and manufacturing to professional athletes and teachers and scientists. So uh, everything in between. And in fact, we pride ourselves in this notion of, you know, a cross movement solidarity where professional baseball players and soccer players are walking picket lines with bakery workers who were on strike and, you know, showing the power of coming together collectively. And I think that's what's so unique about this moment is working people see themselves in community with each other because of the failures of the economy and the way these profit margins have just skyrocketed. It it isn't just in one industry, right? It's across every industry. Everybody is dealing with the same unfairness, like you said, um, that broken compact that we used to have uh, when companies were successful, they would share with their workers. And that is no longer the case. Um, and so we're seeing it across, um, you know, all types of jobs. But I think what we're, we're about really is just giving people a voice, knowing that if corporate wealth is, is off the charts, that there is a way to fight back. There is a way to balance the scales, that we don't have to just sit back and take it, that we can actually come together and make that change. And so we have doubled down on the idea of um, the labor movement's growth and that we should be setting goals for ourselves. And so that's what we've been doing at the AFL-CIO is 
really focusing on what we call organizing new types of work and workplaces that in the past have really never seen themselves as places where unions would be. Um, so, for example, in the tech industry, where working people are, you know, at Google and Apple and and Alphabet forming unions. So whether you're a software developer or someone in quality assurance, um, someone who writes code, that you come together with your coworkers to deal with the issues that really are plaguing your workplace. And I remember not long ago when um, sexual harassment, you know, was running rampant in Silicon Valley, and um, workers organized a walkout. And you know, they walked out for a day, and of course, the company was sat there and, and just, you know, kind of looked at their watches and said, okay, they'll be back tomorrow. And when workers came back in, they had a sense of power, but it was only a one day walkout. It wasn't a collective bargaining agreement. And so that's what people are realizing now. If you want to make permanent lasting change, that sitting across the table in a collective bargaining posture with your employer really is the tool to achieve the things you want to achieve in the workplace, that it's a legally binding process that forces your employer to that table. Uh, and certainly collectively bargaining for better wages and, and health care and retirement security, but also basic respect. I mean, I hear more from workers now that yes, wages are important, but really it's about being treated with respect, being listened to in the workplace. And and, you know, having a, a voice um, and not just being taken for granted and feeling like you're a number. And so that's what we're seeing, you know, in industries of the future, whether it's technology, whether it's all these clean energy industries that are really growing in, in offshore wind and solar and, and hydrogen, you know, chips fabricating uh, with all of the investments coming down from the Biden administration in, in chips and science and infrastructure, that there's this huge opportunity for all this new type of work um, to be good, high road union jobs of the future. That's right. And because ultimately it works. I mean, that's the people have no desire to go back to being some sort of feudal system where we're all serfs on someone else's land. Right. And that's sort of what we're we've become for a while, right? Like I think about I, when I was reading about that Massachusetts public transportation thing, as an example, those union leaders agreed to a contract where their bus drivers were going to receive like way higher salaries and starting pay. And then all of a sudden, the Massachusetts transportation was getting like this surge of applications. And they were like, well, that's crazy. And I was like, it's not really that crazy. Like it's something we're going to see play out over and over again. Like it's not brain surgery to see that if you elevate pay and you increase benefits and you respect your workers, more people are going to want to work there, right? Like if you look at the UPS negotiations, so those Teamsters, if people don't know, the Teamsters negotiated, the company agreed, and 86% of the union members voted yes to this new five-year contract for UPS. So along with wage increases and a minimum of $21 an hour, it also included UPS agreeing to do things like put in air conditioning in their trucks because these people were so hot, ending forced overtime, eliminating a two-tier pay system for drivers, those kind of things. The contract is actually considered one of the most lucrative contracts in labor history. These are major wins, right? And a lot of people see the UPS deal as sort of a game changer, a new template for how workers should be paid, how they should be protected nationwide. And it's kind of the hope that it'll put pressure on other companies facing this kind of labor unrest to start raising their standards too. And we should note that one of the reasons it worked is what you're talking about, this collective bargaining thing. UPS came to the table from a position of power. They have 340,000 members, right? So the fact that it would be an absolute disaster if all of those people stopped working at the same time was the power they had, this collective agreement that they would come to the table and then the company had to negotiate in good faith. And that's why companies like Starbucks and Amazon are fighting so hard to make sure their workers don't unionize. That's right. And, you know, the auto workers at the big three auto manufacturers are at the collective bargaining table right now as we speak and have yes. voted 97 percent to authorize a strike if necessary, because on September 14th, when their contract anniversary date is up, they're going to have to choose whether to go on strike. If collective bargaining, that give and take that we talk about with the employer uh, breaks down and the company decides 
to walk away, they'll have no choice but to use that ultimate weapon, which is to go on strike. And so that would be another seminal moment for the economy, because just like UPS, um, it's a big industry that keeps our country moving, literally. Um, and, you know, <laughs> to have those folks go on strike would be a very big deal. It really would be a big deal. And like, I think about this stuff all the time. I think they have to go. They have to go on strike. And you can see why UBS was like, oh, shoot, oh, shoot. If we're not going to deliver a single package, like the economy is going to go grinding to a halt. Same thing with the auto industry. And that's why things like Starbucks really bug me. Starbucks and Amazon, right? Because A, I use those products a lot. And now I'm thinking I shouldn't. And B, because like Starbucks got their name on the map for being a good employer with great benefits who treated their employees well. And now you're like, well, you know. They call their employees partners. Yes. And like, if people don't know, Starbucks has mounted one of the biggest union busting campaigns in decades, which experts have said only highlights the flaws in our nation's labor laws because Starbucks can't even be fined for firing their pro-union workers. They've basically taken this scorched earth policy targeting union leaders and union stores for retaliation. So an advisor to Starbucks unionization said that Starbucks is basically starving out their union supporters. They're cutting their hours. They're hurting their stores. They're cutting their staff. They're not giving unionized workers credit card tips. They're basically doing everything they can to say, look at the union stores. That's what it's going to be like if you unionize. So don't unionize, right? And some of the worst cases are they close their stores that unionized. In Ithaca, New York, there were three Starbucks. They were the first city in the U.S. where every Starbucks worker was unionized. And Starbucks closed all three stores, right? The company said they did it for business reasons. But it yeah. Yeah. It had nothing to do with that. It was that the business of the unions was cutting into their bottom line, right? There was no reason to close those doors. They, they basically want to burn the unions to the ground. And as a union leader, I'm sure you hate tactics like that. It's retaliation, pure and simple. I mean, and it's illegal, but the problem is our labor laws are so broken that it's the cost of doing business. Starbucks doesn't really get, you know, penalized. Um, it's a slap on the wrist, if anything. And so they break the law with impunity. And, you know, they close stores, they harass uh, union activists, they drag their feet in negotiations so they'll never get to a first contract. And it's frustrating, of course, for workers who have put everything on the line who have pushed through all of the obstacles despite the broken labor laws and formed this union. It's an act of heroism. And the company stonewalls them at every turn. And basically, ha there are no consequences. And so the, the couple of things I'll, I'll just put out on the table. Number one is that, you know, the public should be outraged that the laws have been tilted so far in favor of corporations that Really, it has eroded workers' power over decades. And so we need change and we need to pass the PRO Act, which is a piece of legislation that would really put you know, meaningful fines um, in place for these companies that break the law and allow workers a voice and a seat at the table. Um, and then secondly, you know, it is about what kind of consumers are we? Um, like you said, you almost feel like, you know, it's, it's time to boycott. But what I think we should be doing is showing up for those workers, showing support so that, you know, we want to continue to patronize, unionize Starbucks stores. We want to go in there and give them, you know, a thumbs up. And, and in your app, you can actually change your account name to Union Strong so that when your orders complete, they yell out, uh, coffee ready for Union Strong. Um, so these are some of the things we can do as supporters uh, to shore up the workers who have taken these risks and also raise awareness among our community members, our friends, our family that uh, showing up for the people who are holding the line for all of us is is truly an important thing we can all be doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why don't you just give me a quick pitch for unions? Like if someone was trying to decide if unionization was right for them or if they wanted to join a union or start a union, what would you say? We are here to support you. Um, and I know there are a lot of folks out there who are like this union thing. Um, you know, that might have been something for my grandfather or someone that worked in a particular industry, you know, maybe an industrial setting. That might have been a place where union would be appropriate but not for me. Well, that's absolutely not the case that unions are for everyone because unions are a group of people coming together collectively to change what they'd like to see in their workplace and to do it together. And that can be something as simple as 
a workplace safety issue that you've that's been on your minds. It can be issues around predictable schedules. It can be harassment and discrimination, which I know as a woman who is leading in this labor movement, um, you know, we are still making, you know, pennies on the dollar that men are making in the workplace for the same work. Uh, So there's a pay gap there. The best way to close the pay gap is to join a union. So I think that there's a misperception out there that unions only are for certain types of work. And so that would be one thing I would put out there is no, unions are for for every type of job. And if you wanna form one, we wanna help you do it. And I guess the other thing that I would say is that in this era of runaway corporate wealth where CEOs are making 272 times the average worker, let me say that again, 272 times, Used to be about 20 times, 20 to one. Now it's 272 times. And it's not because they're working 272 times harder than the rest of us. Um, It's just essentially they've been able to amass unconscionable levels of wealth at the expense of working people. And so the way we balance those scales is to come together collectively in unions to get to a seat at the table to negotiate our fair share because we're the workers who are making those profits possible. (laughs) And so I think that's the the thing that people should remember is you're worth more, you're, you're worth better. Um, And you don't have to just sit back and take it and put up with bad bosses and bad customers and toxic work environments. You can use a union as the path forward. And what about the misnomers about unions, like they protect low performers or they're harmful to the employer? Do you want to dispel any of those negative myths that we often hear that are often brought down by corporate overlords who want us to not unionize? (laughs) That's exactly right. And I think there are misperceptions that, you know, unions take a workplace to the lowest common denominator. I think that is a misperception because of our the corporate folks who want you to think that a union is going to hold you back when in fact a union is what helps propel you forward. A union is that rising tide that lifts all boats and makes um, you know fairness and justice and equity possible in your workplace. And I think um, especially for those of us who've been in the labor movement for a long time, we have seen um, a, a sort of shift in our culture as unions. We've modernized as the workplace has modernized. And for those who have had experiences in the past with unions who maybe were built for a different era, we're like every other piece of workplace policy or conditions. We evolve and change and we're nimble and flexible to meet the needs of the modern workforce. And so a union is really defined by its members. We're democratic institutions. So right now we're seeing a lot of activism among young people who want to see their unions be more active in the community and make those community connections. And so we're seeing, for example, in disaster relief, where a hurricane hits, a wildfire happens, any natural disaster that takes place, the union really is the on the front lines of those responses. And the members themselves are in the community making connections with people who've been displaced from their homes, um, showing up with food and gas cards and equipment and supplies to help people get back into their homes. And I think it's that community connection that we're really seeing um, on the rise that unions play a role outside the workplace and translate into our lives even, you know, after we clock out. Yeah, it's not just about work, it's about our society, it's about what we're creating, it's about community, it's about all of it. And I think unions also kind of are about protecting the future, right? You said you've evolved, unions have evolved over the years. It's not your grandfather's union. I mean, we just right. did a podcast at the beginning of the summer focusing on the Hollywood strike with the WGA and SAG-AFTRA. And one of the things we talked about was the challenge of taking care of workers with the rise of AI, right? And so I think it's yeah. reasonable to wonder where working people fit in in the age of thinking machines. How do we protect the humans when the computers keep getting smarter? I mean, what are your thoughts thoughts on that. Hey everybody, it's Michael Steele, host of the Michael Steele podcast. Each week I discuss key political and cultural issues joined by America's leading activists, experts, and academics for conversations that transcend political boundaries. And that's the point. 
I want you to join me as we work through real solutions, have honest conversations, just keeping it real and having a little fun on the side. So listen to the Michael Steele podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or wherever you get your podcasts on. Because you know I love it when you do. So when I'm working, which is all the time, I tend to get peckish midday, which leads me to our snack cupboard where I end up eating Sour Patch Kids or chips, which is not the best, most healthy thing to eat, and it's certainly not feeding my brain, which is why I love mosh bars. Now, I've said before that I'm not typically a protein bar person. It's the texture. So in the past, I have avoided them. I know they're good for me, but I don't like them, so I don't eat them. And then here comes mosh. Mosh is a protein bar made for your brain. It supports brain health with ingredients like lion's mane, collagen, and omega-3s. But it also has 12 grams of protein, only 160 calories, and one gram of sugar. So if you're busy or constantly on the go or need a guilt-free snack, you're gonna wanna try Mosh protein bars. Don't settle for a mediocre snack when you can nourish your body and your mind with the fuel it needs to succeed. Whether you're at the gym, at your desk, or just living your best life, Mosh protein bars will keep your body and brain fit, fueled, and feeling good. And you know I love a product with a cause. Mosh bars were founded by Patrick Schwarzenegger and his mother, Maria Shriver, who are on a mission to make a difference and are donating a portion of all the proceeds from Mosh bars to support brain research at the Women's Alzheimer's Movement at the Cleveland Clinic. These are good people making good things for good reasons. So head to moshlife.com slash politicsgirl to save 20% off plus free shipping on your first six count trial pack. That's 20% off plus free shipping on your first six count trial pack, which includes all of their delicious flavors. I personally love their lemon white chocolate and peanut butter crunch. M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash politics girl. As my grandmother would say, delicious, nutritious. So I've been talking about Miracle Made sheets a lot these days, and it seems like you guys really like them. Working with Miracle Made, I have learned a lot about how much bacteria our sheets actually have on them, which is why we often get acne or allergies or even stuffy noses from our beds. And even though that information feels pretty gross, knowing there are companies like Miracle Made who offer entire lines of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding to help solve this issue really helps. Miracle Made bed sheets use silver-infused fabrics that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, so they stay cleaner three times longer than regular sheets. They're also super comfy, soft and luxurious without the high price of other soft and luxurious sheets. So stop sleeping in bacteria and sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code politicsgirl at checkout, you will get three free towels and save an extra 20%. That's a great deal. A Miracle is so confident that you will love their product, they've backed it with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl to claim your three-piece towel set and save over 40% at checkout. That's trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl. I applaud our writers and our performers who've been standing up and holding the line because digital automation, AI, robotics, you know, these technologies, they're here, they're here to stay, um, and they're going to have major, major ramifications for our society, for our economy, for our jobs, um, and, you know, are going to transform our relationship to work. And I don't care what type of work you do, it is going to affect your job. And so for better or worse, we are dealing with technology, but what we do want is a seat at the table. We want a voice in the process. We want to be included and consulted on the design of these technologies up front, upstream, so that it's not just about when a technology is implemented. It's about the design up front. How are you incorporating how these technologies will enhance people's work and enhance their lives and not degrade us and dehumanize us or replace us? And so I think that's something we all need to be thinking about. And in particular, you know, the actors have a unique uh, take on this subject because of how their images can be manipulated and the use of artificial intelligence to emulate someone's voice and their image. And it can be actually manipulated and used in ways without their permission 
is terrifying. And none of us want to live in that world, right? So we want to make sure that that workers' voices are, again, included in the technology development. Um, We want protections and guardrails um, with our policies. And that's what the labor movement is fighting for. We um, at the AFL-CIO have a, a technology institute where we're coming up with the best strategies, the best policies and collective bargaining language to make sure that workers have that seat at the table. This whole idea of this sci-fi future with machine learning has come up on us so fast that I think people are just trying to grasp the potential of what it means in all the industries they work in. I mean, you're saying Hollywood is like right at the forefront of this right now, but you're talking about it like we do, it doesn't take much imagination to see that technology is going to overtake us if we don't put up those guardrails fast. But the question is like, okay, who puts up those guardrails, right? Because I don't think we can count on this incredibly divided government doing that job pretty effectively right now. The Republicans have made it clear they have no interest in working with the Democrats on much. They're currently spending most of their time defending Trump or seeing if they can impeach Biden for something. So even on Congress's best days, they don't really understand technology, let alone understanding how to regulate it. So then it comes back to unions to ask for yeah. contracts that protect the people when the government can't. And I I don't think we know what the future of technology is going to hold, but we do know that if we leave AI completely in the hands of tech companies and investors and corporations, we can be pretty sure it's going to be used in a way to make the most money for the least amount of people, right? So And inequality is already at record levels, right? And it's just going to grow that gap between the haves and have nots. And I don't know about you, um, the Consumer Electronics Show, I don't know if if any of your listeners have heard of it or been there, but it's a show that happens each year in Las Vegas in January and all the big tech companies show up with all of their fancy technologies. And I went there um, in the last three to five years, I have seen the change happen. And every time I show up there, I'm looking at, you know, technologies like a fully automated restaurant where they have a robot greeting you. They have a robot making the food. They have a robot, you know, cleaning the dishes. We saw military technology that was being utilized um, to uh, monitor workers in a meatpacking facility where if they're wearing something on their wrist that monitors their wrist movements, if they wipe the sweat from their brow, that is considered, you know, time off task. And, you know, it can factor into your compensation, whether you're being productive or not. Liz. This is the tip of the iceberg. And so this is, to me, the next frontier of the labor movement, because we all need a voice. Because who are you going to go to if you're being managed by an algorithm, right? You have no recourse. We saw also the the workers behind AI who are in these essentially modern day sweatshops in places like the Philippines who are, um, you know, doing the back end tagging and identifying of different AI technologies and being paid pennies a day by the biggest companies in this country. So I think the workers rights angle to the future of work, to technology, how it's running away from us with no protections or guardrails is the issue of our time. Absolutely. And I don't think anyone listening, it does not matter what your career is, literally. There are already paralegals and medical grad students being replaced with ChatGBT at law firms for medical research. There is no industry that's going to be safe from this. Like, why use a real surgeon if a machine never gets sick or tired, right? Why use a real lawyer if a computer can just sort through every case that's ever been tried and come out with a case, right? Like, ultimately, Everyone in America, everyone in the world faces the same risk. Every time a technological shift happens, companies and the people in charge rewrite the terms to their advantage, right? So we need to make sure that there are other voices, human voices, workers' voices in the room when those terms are decided, which is probably why you're speaking so directly to young people these days, because this is their future, right? These are the ones that are going to have to be the workers of the future. So it's essential that our young workers aren't miserable and hating their jobs and managed by some drone over their head or something on their wrist. We don't want that for them, right? We need our young people in unions so their voice stays relevant, right? Absolutely. And I think our young people in particular, who are now, as you mentioned at the top of the podcast, are working two and three jobs, 
who have uh, precarity and insecurity in their lives. They feel they're not making enough money. They feel that home ownership is completely out of reach. In fact, they laugh when you mention it. You know, one job should be enough and we should live in a country, the wealthiest country in the world, where our people should be able to live with some measure of dignity and to be able to afford their basic necessities without, um, you know, working again, two and three jobs and having no time with their families and really no security, a baseline level of security um, economically and otherwise. And so this notion of coming together and fighting for a better future, you know, that our livelihoods are at stake, um, that we should come together to create that, that policy framework, the regulations, the landscape out there in our communities of um, a, a shared, prosperous future that we all deserve. We all deserve it. I mean, the next generation of workers, they clearly want something better than their parents have, right? They look around and they are not buying into that take what you can get. You're lucky to have a job, put your head down, be a team player kind of mentality. They, they're they like, nope, I want something better. I want something different. You know, your website itself says when working people come together, they make things better for everyone. And I think that joining unions enables workers to negotiate, to do that, what we were saying, collective bargaining, to say you are a super incredibly rich person making 230 times what your average worker makes, but we are all your workers. And we say, don't treat us like this anymore. This is what we want. We want to be able to take a vacation. We don't want to work 12 hour days where you told us yesterday we're going to come in, that kind of thing. We want to know when our schedule is, when we can be with our children. We want health care. We want safe working conditions. We want to be treated like people. And especially when this influx of machines is coming in, the people need to say, yo, this is what we want. And I think it's essential. And I think we need to make sure, obviously making sure that workers aren't miserable is our goal, but it's also the goal of the president and the Democrats, right? Like Joe Biden has always been incredibly pro-union, pro-worker, and he things like the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Jobs Act, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, those were all major federal investments into good, high-paying jobs for the American worker. How are you feeling about those programs and where unions stand in terms of politics and policy right now? Well, Joe Biden, of course, the most pro-union president in our lifetimes. Um, right. You know, he has definitely put good union jobs at the center of all of their policy work, um, the legislation they've moved. He has a transformative vision of our economy, and um, it's already in motion. You know, with the legislation you just mentioned, um, those jobs are already being created. I think it was 369 billion in clean energy investments um, in the Inflation Reduction Act, and that's of course construction, it's manufacturing, it's included, uh, you know, beyond clean energy, it's lowering the cost of prescription drugs and and uh, the premiums, the subsidies for afford the Affordable Care Act, and there's so much more packed into that bill. But we're focused on the the new jobs that are coming down the pike. Uh, I think it's 1.5 million new jobs that we're, we're forecasting uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act alone to meet the climate crisis. And then, of course, we've got the infrastructure legislation, the uh, manufacturing focus alone, which I believe has been very unique to this administration to say, we're done offshoring uh, our R&D capacity and our manufacturing capacity. Uh, we want to bring those jobs home. We want to have a domestic supply chain that we can rely on so that when we're in a pandemic and we need ventilators or we need semiconductors, we can manufacture those at home and not be reliant on China and other places. So it's a very exciting time, uh, a time of no trajectory, but up in terms of creating good union, family sustaining jobs. Um, and, and certainly the Chips and Science Act, 52 plus billion um, in funding for semiconductor production. And as you know, when we have that research and development here in the country, that is the baseline for innovation that we have in the past lost control of in, in our country. It's been shipped overseas, just like the manufacturing jobs. So we want to bring all of it back here. 
And then while investing in our roads and our bridges and transit, rail systems, airports, um, climate change mitigation, you know, the internet, broadband um, upgrades, all of that is going to create that high road, high wage future that we want our kids and grandkids uh, to be looking forward to and to provide that stability, not only of good jobs, but of a society, like you said, that we all want to live in. I mean, I also just heard that the National Relations Labor Board, which is the independent federal agency under the president that enforces the National Labor Relations Act, has ruled that if bosses commit unfair labor practices in the run up to union elections, then the elections are going to be canceled and the board is going to order that employer to immediately recognize and bargain with that union. So union busting is going to become a lot harder under the Biden administration. And I think this is the kind of thing we need to keep clear that if we want these kind of protections, if we want this kind of respect for the American worker, if we want to bring jobs home, we want to have all of these bonuses to the American worker, then we need to keep the pro-union party in the White House. You know, we also really can't forget that since 1989, 49 million jobs have been created and 47 million of them, that is 96 percent of those jobs have come under Democratic presidents. So people are always pretending the Democrats are big spenders, but we're actually big job creators. And I think people also just love to blame the government for everything. But that is because there has been a huge push over the past 50 years to do that, right? To let the corporations with their massive profits and their ridiculous C-suite pays and their bonuses operate in the shadows and then buy their politicians to vote against things like minimum wage and healthcare savings and collective bargaining and keep the rest of us poor and desperate. So we can't leave our jobs and we can't ask for too much and we can't do it because we don't have any other choice and we just kind of have to take it. And we're sitting here saying, you know what, maybe we don't have to take it. We want to ask for more. And we have an administration right now that has our backs while we do it. And Lee, you are so absolutely right. And that's why we all need to wake up to unpack all of this incredible work that the Biden administration has done and translate it out to our communities because there's been a disconnect between what's been happening in Washington and that these investments that are finally landing at the community level didn't just fall from the sky man- magically. They're, they were intentional policies that were created by this president. And you know, connecting those dots is one of the biggest jobs that the labor movement has in front of us, which we are hard at work already mobilizing our members in every city and every state in the country to show what this administration has done to create that future that we've been working so hard for, for decades, you know, an industrial policy that we've been, you know, trying to um, get those investments made for, for decades and decades. So we're going to have our work cut out for us um, as the election of 2024 approaches. We're, we're definitely one of the key organizations left in the country that has the reach at the grassroots level that can educate and mobilize real working people in every workplace and every part of the country. Um, and so we're, we're already at t- hard at work doing that and we'll continue to do that in the months to come. Oh, I'm so glad. We're going to need all of you guys to come out, every single one of your members. I want to thank you for joining us today, Liz. There is really unprecedented support for unions and strikes and workers' rights and workers' passion right now. And I think the role that that can play in the bettering of the life of all Americans. And I think we need to set a new precedent at this point. I think every day more of us realize that the American dream shouldn't be this out of reach for so many of us and that we should all have the opportunity to succeed. And I think that starts with the revival of organized labor. Thank you so much for uh, your support. And uh, I wanted to let your listeners know that the labor movement is on the rise. We are ascendant and we are opening our doors wider than ever. We are welcoming people into our movement, people who've never thought of forming unions, young people, people of color, women. A lot of people don't know that the labor movement is the largest organization of working women in the country. How about that for a a myth buster? And that we are on the move. And so the best way that we have to make the change that we want to see in our workplaces is to come together collectively in a union. And I want to thank you for your support. Oh, thank you. If people want to get in touch with your company, uh, your corporation, your federation, how would they do that? 
We're at aflcio.org, aflcio, no dashes, uh, .org, and join our movement. Join their movement if you're a bunch of coffee shops in Louisville or you're a bunch of tech workers in Silicon Valley. Join the right. unions. Okay. Thanks a lot, Liz. Happy Thank Labor Day. So Happy Labor Day. So that was Liz Schuler, president of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, reminding people that there is a path forward for American workers and the people are not alone, that there will always be a push and pull between those who own the corporations and those who work for them. But with the combined efforts of unions to represent the worker and a government who respects and supports the importance of the worker, we can truly begin to reverse the unconscionable level of wealth and fairness inequality in this country and allow working people to once again partake in the American dream. Unions are the collective voice of the people asking to be heard, and they deserve our respect and our support. I want to thank Liz for being here today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go out and support a striking worker. They're fighting for all of our futures. Until next week, PGF. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.